Good to see you this, this afternoon. Appreciate you being at Penns Creek Camp. Just a little announcement here at the beginning. Somebody gave me a key over in this direction. It's not a Ford. It's not any a main brand. It starts with an S-T-R-A-T-E-C at the end, something like that. Anyway, it's your key. See me. I want to get rid of it. I got rid of another wallet today. Well, a lady's one. Found the right owner of it. But I'm still possessed of the one I made mention I found in the men's bathroom. I'm still in ownership of that, possession of that right now. So I just make that short announcement along that line. For us big mouth people, I'm, some of you don't aren't in that. But after I got saved, oh, I like make a joyful noise. I love that verse. I mean, when you can't always sing in tune. That noise part sounds really biblical for us. <laughs> it's up in my family, I bet. We were like, we made the noise. Oh, yeah. Loud noise. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that, that was reading in the Bible. I was thinking, man, we're just so blessed with all these certain abilities around camp meeting. And, and I was reading the scriptures today, just looking through different ones like I often do. Just start going through the scriptures and... I had a few to share with you today out of Psalm 33. I thought it was interesting. I never quite saw this connection before. Psalm 33 starts out pretty normal for me. Psalm 33, 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. That means it's easy. It doesn't mean it's easy for you to testify. It means it's easy because it's in the heart. So it wants to come out of your mouth. So we have to work on getting it out of there, but it's in there. It's easy for the upright. Then it says, praise the Lord with harp. Yep. Sing with him in psalmistry and with the instrument of ten strings. Sing in him with a new song. Play skillfully. Boy, we got a lot of those around here, don't we? I mentioned those all them young people down there. And our instrument players up here, the different ones that fill in and work together. Don't you appreciate that level of skill, ability that God's given them? We are blessed by that. And our holiness movement has so many skillful players. But here's the part that kind of, I had to make sure I wasn't getting this out of interpretation. You know, messing up hermeneutically, like, you know what I'm saying? Here's what I found after that. Skillfully with a loud noise. That's interesting to me. How do you do it skillfully with a loud noise? I mean, because I'm only thinking of how we did it. <laughs> it was loud. It wasn't always in harmony, but it was loud. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. I got that covered good. And then I got to think about, you know, you know one thing about we did? We gave it everything we had wholeheartedly. And don't you appreciate, and we've got them around here at camp, they pray skillfully with that, 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 with that expertise, yet it has that, you know what I mean, it has that special something that God honors, because it's just like with all the heart too. And haven't you seen that with our musicians and the songs they pick out, the prelude music, it brings us to worship. Part of that reason is because they've thought about it, they prayed over it, they're praying loudly, skillfully. And, oh, God uses that, doesn't he? So as we continue these services these days, let's continue the worship and the prelude music, allow it to help us in our spiritual life and, and our testimonies that you feel led to share them. And let's continue to worship our great God because he's worthy to be worshiped. And what a great message we heard this morning. Uh, just thank God for it. God used Brother Purdy and sharing, and we know that God's going to continue to help through this in Cam. And Brother Stratton, come and lead us, please. All right, after that exhortation, you don't have much excuse. You're going to have to sing loudly this afternoon. So shake off those cobwebs, wake up, and take your chorus book, and let's turn to song number 111. Song number 111, I Claim the Blood.
your house on one day. And the Lord said, when are you going to talk to your grandpa? And I stopped everything and I went up there. And I talked to my grandpa. God saved him. Praise and God. My grandpa said, I've never seen daddy. Uh, he was doing he was in, in the hospital and he had his hands up and he's flying and he's praying. He said, I've never seen Patrick like that before. I knew God saved Patrick. Amen. Thanks. I'm so glad for so many more. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. Praise yes. God. I love you. Yes. Amen. Glory. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise Covers the whole man, doesn't it? For my sin, my sickness, my pain. Sometimes those pains are many, not just physical. There's other pains that we have in our life that we need to plead that precious blood for, for and over in our lives. But that blood is sufficient for the whole man. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Anyone else? Anything on your heart? Been testifying well. Bless you, sister. anything on your heart. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I was thinking how awesome God is to meet our needs when we need those needs to be met. As, uh, I remember praying around the altar last night, and a couple different nights, you know, pray for different people. And, and then last night, um, you know, I just felt like, like all like depleted. Like you're you know, you, you've prayed, sung your best and everything, and just like there's not like many prayers in there yet to help. 
And then I feel bad about that. And the older you get, it seems like it's a little bit maybe more, a little trickier in there. Some things that's going on, you know, kind of like, you know what I'm saying? And uh, maybe you understand what I'm being. But so I, then one person asked me to pray for them. And I went down. And it was neat because it's like right then, just like the Lord just kind of like, you know, he give you just what you needed for right then. And it's just like, isn't that, it's just kind of neat, you know? Because it was just like unexpected. And they asked me to just come down for a few moments. And the, the right words were right there. Everything was just, and it was just, you, you like, you're, you just kind of shocked yourself. God just like, you know, he does that. You know, he just shocks you. Like, that is really neat that, how that worked out. Then, uh, then this morning in prayer, it was just like beautiful because it's just like, you know, as you're praying, the Lord just like really, as you're praying for all those people, God was like, God's like meeting your needs too while you're praying for these other people. And you just have that special time in prayer, just like you feel like, you know, all the words are going exactly where they need to be. And God's just like, especially God in prayer, you know what I'm talking about, Christians. It's just like awesome. It's just like, isn't it how, isn't it how neat, how quick things can change in our, in our lives right there. And then now today I feel all full tilt again. You know what I'm saying? But God's just like that, isn't he? He knows what you need, and he knows how to get, and he uses different ways to do it. And right while I was, prayer was the one that was going to be hardest, most depleted, and he filled that prayer right up. Right in the area of need, he met that need. So I just praise him that God is just an awesome God that just, just knows where we are and when to do it and how to do it in our lives. We're going to pray at this time. I'm going to give a request here. Let's get Brother Barry Schweitzer with us. He's our pastor from Hanover, good friend of ours, too, and he'll be leading us in prayer here shortly. But we've been praying for uh, Brother Shane Hunter. Uh, Rhoda's mom did go home. Uh, Ruth Cash, we appreciate the Lord helping her to get home. Kathy Zank, uh, again, with uh, physical needs that she has. Uh, Russ Whitmer, Sister Gerke, and she transferred to the uh, next place, but she's going to need some prayers. Brother Walborn. Uh, Lord, uh, just continue to help him in a special way. Sister uh, Keister did not have her surgery, uh, so yet that was, they, don't, they canceled that for right now, but anyway, still needs it. Uh, Ken Hedrick uh, with a stroke, and again, other ones we've been praying for, and um, uh, at least me, I've been praying, especially for some that I see maybe linger around the altar, and maybe struggling with the situation, circumstance, and you know, every once in a while, we don't know what to do. And so as you see, and they come to your mind, especially those that maybe just, you know, just lingering around the altar a little bit, just pray for them. God, just help them to have a good day today. Lord, pour your spirit and enlighten them. I mean, just help them to be able to, to see what area that is. And Lord, some way today, through someone or through the word of God or through a message, Lord, just, just give them what they need, Jesus. Isn't God good to do that? So let's pray that God just continue to help and continually clarity. There's been a lot of great victories, a lot of great spiritual help given. But we want the devil defeated in every person's life. Yeah. And by our God and by his wisdom and help and the prayers of God's people, God's able to do that. So we want Brother Barry to come lead us. God bless you. Uh, let's kneel in prayer for those here. And Brother Barry, lead us, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for Penn's Creek Camp. For the blessings that it has been throughout the years, Lord, and the victories that have been won, we thank you for the help that you've given in this camp thus far. But, Father, we come for this service. We come and ask that you would help and you would meet needs and you would work and move in a special way. We pray, dear Father, teach us how to worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, we pray that, dear God, you would be with the remainder of the service. You would bless the Mealies as they sing. Anoint Brother Fuller again, Lord, and help him to preach thy word. And may our hearts be receptive, Lord. And may this not be a wasted service whatsoever, but may hearts be touched, may lives be changed. May thy kingdom go forward because of this afternoon service. Uh, be with each one that is here now. Be with those online, dear Father. Minister and help in a special way. Uh, we pray for these needs that have been requested. Uh, we may not be able to remember them all, but we're thankful that you do. Uh, we pray that you'd be with Brother Hunter, Lord, and that this situation uh, will have come to pass, dear God, and you'll give him the touch. 
that he needs. Bless Sister Castor and minister, Lord, uh, to her need. And give to Sister Zink the touch, Lord, uh, that she needs from you. Minister to these others, God. Uh, give them your touch and give them your help. Uh, and oh, God, may we just continue to seek after God with all of our hearts. May, dear Father, you help us to take home to our churches a, a fire that's burning that we'll be able to reach the lost in our communities, Lord, we pray. We'd ask again, Lord, that you would bless this service, this encampment, dear Father. May there be victory that eternity will be reveal. And for what you do, we'll thank and praise you as we give the glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Brother Barry. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your attendance in this service today. Uh, missionary Crusaders be given an update. We'll lift an offering for them to be a blessing to the Missionary Crusaders Department in, in the pre service time tonight. The maid is going to share. God bless them as they do. And then afterwards, Brother Jeremy be sharing uh, the Word of God.
glad that that songwriter didn't say, I just love this old-fashioned way of holiness. But I'm glad they added that word sweet. That's a key word. That's a key word. And it is sweet. And it is sweet. And I know, I'm sure you have stories, and I do too, of where those that professed it wasn't made, maybe so sweet. But I've been around the real. Amen. I've been around the genuine. Right. I've got Thanks. some heroes. Yeah. Soldiers of the cross. Veterans right. that have trod the path before me. Amen. And I'm spoiled for anything else. I'm glad it's sweet. We're going to sing that chorus one more time. I love this old-fashioned way of sweet holiness. It will lead me upward. It will lead me onward. I love this old-fashioned way of sweet holiness. It works in all. so thankful they've chosen to be here. I think there's an extra little draw this year. This young lady on the piano bench, just a little extra draw. And uh, appreciate their entire family. And uh, brother and sister Barnard have raised a godly family. And many of their children are serving the Lord. And I thank the Lord for their friendship, their influence. And uh, Mary Lee's a special young lady to us. And uh, Janelle. Sister Janelle, and they've come to Duncannon for a number of years for our youth event, and we just love and appreciate them so very much. Well, this afternoon, I'm going to try to make the second installment on the Exodus study that we began on Saturday afternoon. I will not be preaching this afternoon. I will be teaching, so I won't plan to scream at you. And all God's people said, praise the Lord. <clears throat> but before I take my text, I do also want to recommend that if you have not been to the bookstore to see Kathy Zink has put out six of her hymns CDs, that would be a tremendous asset to you throughout this next year. You can take some of this good music that she plays on the organ home with you. She's a very accomplished musician, and uh, there are six CD sets over there. They're either $12 for a single CD or you can get the entire set for $70. And I highly recommend you take that with you uh, from camp sometime before Saturday night. I'm going to ask for your attention to Exodus 20. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20. While you're finding that... For those of you that were not here with us on Saturday afternoon, you're just joining us and you're not sure exactly what this is all about, let me just give a few introductory remarks. The book of Exodus basically tells the three different stories about God's people. It tells the story of liberation. It tells the story of uh, covenant. And it tells the story of worship. And uh, these three parts of Exodus... From chapter 1 to chapter 15, chapter 16 to chapter 25, chapter 26 to chapter 40 can be divided 
into uh, sections, if you please, where God was trying to get his people out. That's what the word exodus means, out of, the road out or the way out. And God's method for getting his people out of physical bondage or physical slavery from the Pharaoh was ten confrontations. And uh, if you were here Saturday, we tried to give you a visual demonstration of how those confrontations are arranged in the biblical text and the meaning of those, uh, at least in part. And then God's method of getting the Israelites out of spiritual darkness because they lived for more than four centuries in a heathen culture with no direct communication from God. They were very idolatrous. They were heathen in their uh, lifestyles. And so we have God uh, providing a way to get them out of that spiritual darkness that had enveloped their minds and gave them ten commandments. And then in, on Friday afternoon, if God is willing, I will give you the final installment uh, in this series in which we'll talk about their alienation from God and God's method of getting them out from that position is to give them uh, ten curtains or the tabernacle. And um, each one of these parts of Exodus, we see a different uh, part of God's character on display. In the first part of Exodus, we see God's sovereign power. God sovereignly steps in and confronts Pharaoh and Pharaoh's gods and demonstrates Yahweh's power and His majesty. In the second part, we see God's holiness uh, predominantly on display as the mount is quaking with fire and burning with fire until an animal, if it touches the mount, it must be thrust through with a dart. And God's message is, I'm holy, and so don't come close. And there's a separateness about God's holiness. And, and we see God's holiness on display. In the third part of Exodus, we see God's wisdom on display in the giving of the uh, system of Jewish worship that is spelled out for us in that part of Exodus. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, on Friday. I'd like to read to you from Exodus 20. Before I do, just let me also comment that the word Exodus actually appears in the New Testament three times. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 31, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says that Moses and Elijah appeared in glory with Jesus, and Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. And uh, as they discussed, as Elijah and, and Moses discussed with Jesus, it says, and they spake of his decease. But the word is actually exodus uh, in the Greek, and, and he spake, they spake of his exodus and that he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And then in Hebrews eleven twenty two, 22, we find Joseph's last words when he's giving instructions about his bones that they are to be carried up when God leads the children of Israel out of, of, of bondage there, and he uses that word exodus. And then 2 Peter 1, 15, Peter talks about his decease or his exodus after his martyrdom and gives instructions. And so this word actually appears in the New Testament. But predominantly this afternoon, I want to remind you uh, of, of this particular part. It's at the center of this part of Exodus, the Ten Commandments, the moral law. Before I ask you to stand and we read from it, I just also want to remind you of the importance of the number 10 in the Bible. And a, a couple of things that I did not mention uh, on Saturday, I'll, I'll add to the list today. But uh, I did mention this, but I'll start with it. Ten times. Ten times in the Genesis creation account, we read, God said. God said. God spoke. And there was power in God's voice, creative power. There's ten generations from Adam to Noah. It's the antediluvian world. There was a fullness of opportunity, opportunity for mankind. And uh, the flood came and carried them all away and there was judgment. And then here's a new one. There are ten dreams recorded in the book of Genesis. And if you'd like a copy of where you find those ten dreams, I'd be happy to share it. I can prove it. There are ten dreams, not nine, not eleven. There are ten dreams in the book of Genesis recorded for us. And then also there are ten different songs recorded from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. And so the Torah, the law of God, actually has ten specific songs that were composed and sung at appropriate times uh, throughout that period of Israel's history. Of course, the Passover lamb was to be selected on the 10th day of the first month of the Jewish year. The Day of Atonement 
Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, was to be observed on the 10th day of the 7th month. The Holy of Holies was to be 10 cubits by 10 cubits in its dimension. And, and many, many, many other aspects of this important number throughout the Bible. And I just remind you of that this afternoon because this part of, Gen or this part of Exodus, of course, uh, we see God dividing up uh, according to the number 10. 10 confrontations, 10 commandments, and 10 curtains. Not 9, not 11, 10. And I'm, again, I'm going to reserve comment on the significance of that, except but to say it represents fullness, it represents God's authority, it also repre re represents man's responsibility uh, with regards to the tithe and the tenth that was to belong to the Lord. And uh, so we'll come now to the chapter that's before us this afternoon for consideration. Let's stand for just a moment to read through this important part of God's Word. I have felt for months, in fact, I probably have been clearer about this message than any other message I have preached or will preach. I have felt very clearly, specifically directed in my remarks today. And without apology, I'll take us to them in just a few moments. Verse number one, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Amen. I so appreciate my in-laws, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and of course my mother is here, and I deeply appreciate all three of them. I'm going to ask my father-in-law, Larry, because if he would pray for me this afternoon. Yes. Excuse me. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> this afternoon, I want us to specifically look at one commandment. I do not have the opportunity of time to be able to go through all the significance of all ten. But before I do, I want to draw specific attention to the division of the commandments there are 25 different verses of Scripture in which we find very specific details about the two tablets of stone. 23 times in the Old Testament, two times in the New Testament. And I'm going to give you a sampling of how these commandments, uh, how the two tablets of stone, rather, are referenced throughout some of these verses. Exodus 24, 12 and the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me this into the mount and be there, and I will, I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. There is a place for preaching. And probably the majority of this camp meeting should be preaching. But there's also a very real need and place for teaching in the church. Too many times... It's, it's so easy to just adapt to, and conform 
to the lifestyle of our faith group without ever really understanding hermeneutically from the scriptures why we do what we do. And the reason that I believe in many instances there's drift in the church, compromise in the church, uh, is that oftentimes uh, uh, the word of God is not taught hermeneutically. We're not taught the reasons for which we do what we do. And certainly there are things that we do that we can't point to a very specific chapter and verse. Sometimes it's just a principle. But in, in this case, the very teaching of the Ten Commandments has fallen into disfavor. Uh, I, it would probably shock us this afternoon from our God's missionary churches and the churches that are represented. When is the last time you heard a, a, a message on one of the Ten Commandments? Has anybody heard a message on one of the Ten Commandments through the past year? I see two hands in the congregation. It seems as almost as if the Ten Commandments, well, everybody knows the Ten Commandments and everybody understands the Ten Commandments and there's no real need to uh, bore people with things that are so familiar. But the reality is the Ten Commandments are God's first and grandest expression of His will for His holy people. And every single one of the Ten Commandments has no expiration date on it. Because it is a reflection of who God is and who we should be in light of who God is. In Exodus 32 verse 16, we find in the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Even the tables themselves, in the first instance, literally were the work of God. Exodus 34, verse uh, number 1 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. You remember when Moses came down from the mount with the first set of tablets that the people were involved in very idolatrous and licentious worship of a golden calf that his brother Aaron had made. And of course, Moses in disgust and in righteous anger and in threw down those two, those two tablets of stone and broke them until they were irreparable. And we find that God is now telling Moses to come back up to the mountain and uh, that he was to hew two tables of stone like unto the first. God made the first set. Moses had to make the second set. It says, hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Deuteronomy 5, 22, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount of, out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and the thick darkness with a great voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me, Moses said. Verses 1 to 4 of Deuteronomy 10. At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me in the mount, and make thee an ark of wood, and I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shit and wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hand, and he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. Well, these two tablets of stone, although the Bible doesn't specifically tell us, I don't think it much, takes much sanctified imagination uh, to understand why there were two distinct tablets or tables of stone. When you examine the Ten Commandments, it's very clear that the first four are vertical commands. And the second tablet of six are horizontal commands. In other words, the first four commandments are given to govern our relationship to God. Have no other gods before thee. Don't make any graven images to represent me. Keep my name holy. My name is sacred. Don't take it in vain. 
And then God says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so the first, the first four commandments are vertical commands. And it's not hard for me to believe, although I can't prove it, it's not hard for me to believe that that first tablet of stone had the first four commandments written upon it on both sides, the Bible says, with the finger of God. It's not hard for me to believe that the second tablet of stone contained the horizontal commands. The commands from number five all the way to ten, six commandments that specifically dictate God's will for His holy people in our relationship to our fellow man. In other words, the Bible says that we are not to, to, we are supposed, first, we're supposed to honor our parents. We're not to kill. We're not to murder. We're not to commit adultery. We're not to steal. We're not to bear false witness against our neighbor. And we're not to covet that which belongs to our neighbor. So the first tablet, vertical commands. And the second tablet, horizontal commands. And all ten of them equally important to govern God's people, to give us an understanding of God's holiness and what He expects of His holy people in relationship to Himself and in relationship to our fellow man. Now, I want to come for the remaining portion of our time together today to what I believe is the most broken commandment of the ten. The most controversial, the most misunderstood, the most or the least perhaps taught or articulated clearly. You say, well, which one is it? Well, I said this, and this is my opinion. You may have your own opinion about which commandment fits that list. But for months I have felt that God would have me speak to you today about the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In the Christian church today, even in places where they are orthodox around much of the doctrine of the church, the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth, uh, the propitiation necessary for salvation the second coming, and a whole host of other Bible doctrines in many places across Christendom, this commandment, the fourth commandment, it has been wrongly taught that it is no longer important or necessary. Much of the evangelical Christian church has stopped believing that the fourth commandment is still God's will for His people. And so, Sabbath desecration abounds in America. Sabbath desecration in the Christian Evangelical Church of America is almost weekly desecrated by people who profess to love and follow Jesus Christ as devoted followers. Now the great danger as holiness people is we have people that get saved, come into our ranks, and they have been influenced by the evangelical church to the point that they, they honestly, sincerely do not know or understand that the fourth commandment is still very much God's will for His holy people. And if we do not have a systematic, careful articulation of this commandment and its meaning and application to the Christian church, it won't be long before we will not be God's separated holy people. And so I don't just preach this message today because I want you to hear it. I want those that are watching online today to hear it. 
I want those that will listen to this sermon or watch this sermon in days and weeks and months and years to come to hear it. And I want you to have something that you could say to that sincere person that has come into your church that has really no idea about careful, systematic study of the Bible. You could perhaps... Uh, from this lesson this afternoon say, I want you to look at this or listen to this because I intend very carefully to go through the scriptures and to try to persuasively, convincingly show you that the fourth commandment has not been abolished. It has not been erased. Jesus did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill the law. This commandment, remember the Sabbath, is no more expired than the commandment not to murder. This commandment, the fourth commandment, is still as important as do not take my name in vain. This commandment is still as important as thou shalt not commit adultery. But because of a misunderstanding of the New Testament, many Christian churches today have brought Starbucks into their vestibule. Many Christian churches, right across the street from their parking lot, is the, is the finest restaurant that will fill up very quickly once the last amen has been said. It is not popular in Christian America to preach the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm borrowing notes from Dr. Alan Brown, who is a professor at God's Bible School. He has written what I believe is perhaps the finest, short, abbreviated view of this subject that I have ever read or come across. And so with his permission, I'm going to be sharing parts of that 11-page paper with regards to what Christians should do about the Sabbath. There are probably people attending your church, and if they came to you and asked, is Sabbath observance binding on Christians, would you know what to say? Would you know how to carefully take the Bible and explain to them why this particular fourth commandment is still God's will for His holy people. I hope that at the end of the message today, you will at least be better prepared to answer that question. And if there is somebody here today that at the end of the message you say, I'd like to have Dr. Brown's paper, I am happy to make it available to you uh, by email or text. Let me start by saying that God instituted the Sabbath during the first week of creation. Sabbath observance actually predates the giving of these two tablets of stone. We find in the creation account that God, after He created all that is and pronounced it good, the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day and sanctified that day. God did not rest because God was tired. God did not rest because God was weary. God did not rest because He was physically exhausted. God rested and sanctified the seventh day to teach us that He was, in His creative work, was establishing a rhythm of life that must be observed by all holy people ever after. So for even the man who mistakenly thinks that somehow Jesus' coming has annulled the, this part of the moral law, I can tell you that before the law was ever given, the institution of Sabbath observance predates the law by more than a thousand years. God deliberately created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is in six days and then rested on the seventh day. He did this to establish his design for mankind's week. A week is to be seven days containing of six days for work and one day for rest and worship. Genesis 2-2, Exodus 20, verses 8-11. to 
By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. I read to you uh, Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, so I will not read those words. But I believe that, that the key to understanding this commandment begins with the fact that we must recognize that the word Sabbath does not mean seventh, as in seventh day of the week. The Hebrew word for seventh in the Hebrew Old Testament is a completely different Hebrew word. The word Sabbath does not mean Saturday. You see, we not only have the responsibility to rightly teach the the validity and binding power of the fourth commandment, but we also need to be prepared to answer that sincere Seventh-day Adventist neighbor that lives down the street that would like to teach your children that that their parents are really not following the Bible because they're not meeting on Saturday. Are you prepared to talk to your Seventh-day Adventist neighbors and to explain to them why they are in error? Well, the place to start is to recognize that the commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, cannot be in, translated or, or interpreted as remember the seventh day to keep it holy or remember Saturday to keep it holy because the word Sabbath does not mean Saturday and the word Sabbath does not mean seventh. In fact, if God had not continued to explain which day they were to observe, which he, which he actually does in Exodus 20, the, the Hebrew people would have had no clue, no idea simply from the word Sabbath as to which day God wanted them to keep holy. The word Sabbath literally means to rest or means intermission. And so from this fourth commandment, without the declaration that follows, we simply have the command to remember the day of rest. To remember the day of intermission that God has designed for His holy people to observe in all times that one in six is to be set aside as sacred, as belonging to God for the purpose of worship and for the purpose of hitting reset button in your life. Well, I promise not to scream at you in here. I'm not doing very well. I'm screaming. The word Sabbath in the Hebrew means to rest or to cease from working. Uh, I want to give you some information that you may have never heard before, and that's why I'm making this available to you. The Jewish Sabbath before the destruction of Jerusalem under General Titus in AD 70 changed days of the week once every single year between the time of Exodus in 1446 B.C. and the crucifixion. Did you hear what I said? Literally, the Jewish Sabbath itself changed days of the week many, many, many times from the days of the Exodus to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. God, through Moses, gave the children of Israel a system of fixed date Sabbath, which changed once every year between the Exodus and the crucifixion to a different day of the week. And hence, Saturday was never a Jewish Sabbath for over a year at any one time until the destruction of Jerusalem under General Titus. The Roman week from before the birth of Christ to near the close of the 4th century A.D. was eight days long. And hence, that their Sabbath... Sabbaths changed 45 times every year to a different day of the week. Now that is very difficult information for the sincere Seventh-day Adventist to be able to work with. Christ, in fulfillment of the prophecies, made Sunday or the first day, His resurrection day, the Christian Sabbath which remaineth to the people of God as the one and only Sabbath, the day of the Lord which He hath made, and that it shall be last 
to the end of time and become the Sabbath of all nation, nations in which we shall rejoice and be glad. Now, I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 66. Find the prophet Isaiah. Go to the very last chapter of that book. I want to read two verses of scripture to suggest that it is very probable, very likely, I'm not claiming to have 100% accuracy in understanding on this text, but, but I stand with a host of people that have looked at these verses and believe that what we have here is a description of what is to happen with God's holy people in the new created order after Jesus has returned for his bride, after the great white throne judgment, after Satan has been cast into the lake of fire, after the new Jerusalem has come and been set up and everything is established. Look at what it says. In fact, I'm going to read in verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and listen closely, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now, I will not be in any way dogmatic about this text. I simply draw it to your attention to suggest that it is at least plausible to think or consider that at the end of the age, when God has destroyed this present world by fire and has created a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That the Sabbath observance that we have experienced in this age will carry over to the next. Did you read? Did you hear what I read? This is what saith the Lord. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh to come to worship. Now you say, well, I have a hard time recon reconciling that with Revelation. It says that there's no temple and there's no night and there's no day and the Lamb's the light and God's there and every day's a Sabbath. Well, I understand that. That's why I'm not being dogmatic. But these verses mean something. From one Sabbath to another. After the new heaven and the new earth has been created. And God said you will all come to worship. I, I just ask you to consider... If, if the Sabbath was instituted in creation and the Sabbath is to be observed in that new realm by which we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, where, where the Bible says that the Lord has spoken and from one new moon to one Sabbath to the next that all flesh shall come together to worship. Is it, is it plausible to think that somehow in this age of grace and gospel preaching that the Sabbath is no longer important. That the commandment given in the Ten Commandments no longer is necessary. That it's expired. And that we can treat Sunday just like any other day of the week. Mow your lawn. Go out to eat. Run to the grocery store. Boy, it's quiet. I thought I was preaching to the choir. I wasn't expecting to give an altar call, but I may have to. And I'll tell you why I'm preaching this this afternoon or trying to teach this. Because I have been around the Holiness Church and I've pastored long enough to know that some of our people listen to other preachers. On the television, on the radio, on the internet. And it's not too long until they, become, they can become very foggy in their minds 
about whether this is just little something that the holiness people do that really is not scriptural, it's not necessary, it's just kind of a little odd thing that they do. And, and maybe they even admire and respect it a little bit. But, you know, there's, the majority of the church has decided that that's, that's nonsense. That's old-fashioned and that's, that, that, that's really... Hello? I'll tell you another reason that I think this is important. The severity by which God dealt with it in the Old Testament. The first time they found a Sabbath breaker, Moses didn't know what to do. God hadn't told them what to do. Found a man out gathering firewood. And someone came and reported it, and Moses said, well, go get him. Lock him up. We're going to have to talk to God about it. And when Moses talked to God about it, God said, Stone him. Stone him. You know, one of the things that you learn when you study the Old Testament law is that it's to be an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That simply means that the punishment is never to exceed the severity of the crime. Did you hear what I said? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, if a man was found doing something under God's law, you were not permitted to punish him more severely than what the severity of the crime was. And so, you never find in the Old Testament a punishment, capital punishment, for anything related to property. Let me, let me restate that. If, if I stole Jacob Martin's field and it was discovered... Under the Old Testament law, I was not permitted to die for that. I was to make restitution. If I stole his sheep, I was to make restitution. In fact, there's a specific number I was to make. But I was never allowed to be put to death for any crime related to property. God was trying to teach his people that life, human life, is always more sacred than physical property. But when it comes to this matter of Sabbath desecration, God said, stone him. Capital punishment. You understand how serious God is about this? And do you understand how, how in today's Christian America, how the church, the professing organized church, has so desecrated that which is holy, The animals weren't allowed to work. You had to park your ox in the shed, and he got to rest too. Your hired servants weren't allowed to work. Now, I don't have the time to go into all of the reasons for this fourth commandment. And I do want to get to the part that the New Testament specifically addresses because I don't want anybody to be under bondage. There are th clearly three permissions in the New Testament or three clarifications by which the church is to conduct herself and to remain holy, separate, and purified before God. They are as follows. Acts of necessity, acts of mercy, and acts of worship. I can give you an extensive list of passages in the New Testament that teach us that when it is absolutely necessary, it is not a desecration in God's economy. When it is an act of mercy, it is not a desecration in God's economy. When it is an act of worship, it is not a desecration in God's economy. If you'd like to have those verses, I'd be happy to share you with them with you. I'm going to give you just a sampling. We find with regards to deeds of mercy, Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, 11, and 12, and a, and a man was there who had a hand that was withered, and they questioned Jesus, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? 
so that they might accuse him. And he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable than, uh, is, is this man than a sheep? So then, Jesus said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Let me give you another example from the deeds of necessity. Uh, Mark chapter 2. Beginning at verse 23, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying unto him, Look, why, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said, Have you ever read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Then we have deeds associated with worship. Matthew 12, 5. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? The priests had to kill the animals for sacrifice, had to skim them out as prescribed by God and place them on the altar. This involved manual labor on the Sabbath. But it was not secular work for personal financial gain. It was work associated with God's requirement for worship. I don't want to take the time to go through much of the other material that I have today except but to come to the fact that the apostles, the apostles did not change the day of the week. Jesus did. Jesus did. Did you hear what I read? Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. Do you, do you know where our authority for worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday rests? It doesn't rest with Peter, James, and John. It, it doesn't rest with the early Catholic church. Our observance is in accordance with what the Lord of the Sabbath did on the first day of the week regarding his triumph over death, hell, and the grave. He could have raised himself on Saturday if he had wanted to. He could have raised himself on Monday if he had wanted to. But Jesus raised himself on Sunday, the first day of the week. And how appropriate. The Old Testament Sabbath, a day sanctified to look back on the gain of the week and to celebrate what God has done. But the New Testament Sabbath, a day set aside to look forward to what God is doing and going to do. The Old Testament Sabbath looks back on the last six days. The New Testament Sabbath looks forward to the next six days. It was completely appropriate for the Old Testament Sabbath to be on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. But when I look at the commandment, remember the Sabbath, I do not see, remember Saturday or remember the seventh because not, that's not what the word means. The word means remember the intermission day. Remember the rest day. In the Old Testament, it was appropriate for God in the Ten Commandments to spell out which day was the rest day. But because our Gospels tell us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, incarnate in the flesh, resurrected himself by his own power on the first day of the week and met with his disciples, showing them infallible proofs of his resurrection and triumph over death, hell, and the grave. Ever after that, the first day was sanctified and wholly set apart for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, take your Bibles, and I come to a close and turn to Revelation chapter 1.
Look at verse number 9 and 10. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John uses a phrase that to his first century audience needs no explanation. I was in the Spirit when? On the Lord's day. This is the only time in the entire Bible we find that special phrase. The Lord's day. Well, you wouldn't have to use your imagination very much to find out which day of the week that was. Which day is the Lord's day? It's the day that he came out of the tomb. It's the day that the great earthquake came and moved the stone and the soldiers fell as dead men. Why? Because the seal had been broken. Why? Because Jesus had kicked the backside of the tomb out and had descended into the bowels of the earth. And there he conquered over Lucifer and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave and came marching forward, unlocking the gate, setting those that had been waiting for his resurrections, setting them free. The Bible says some of them were seen walking about in Jerusalem that day before they ascended to the Father. The Lord's day. He uses a phrase that absolutely needs no interpretation, no explanation for all of these seven churches that are going to receive this dictated letter from the Lord Jesus Christ. They understand just exactly what he means. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You say, preacher, you're preaching to the choir. We agree with you a thousand percent. Well, glory to God. Reality is what we're silent about and what we never take the time to articulate clearly and to show from God's word is quickly adhered to because it's just what our faith group does. And that's just one of the peculiarities of the holiness people. And if I'm going to be a part of them, I guess that's what I'll have to do. No, this is what God's word says. This is what God's word teaches. So I can tell you when I hear about people that go on family vacations... And because they're away from church, they don't go to church. Hello? Not my family. Every time we go on church, away to family vacation, if we're not close to a holiness church, we try to find a church that is close is to what we believe. If that's a Baptist church, that's a Baptist church. We're not staying at home Live streaming. I thank God for live streaming. I'm 1,000% for it. But it's not the same. One of the reasons it's not the same is because there's people in that church you need to shake their hand. They need to hear you testify. They need to know that you love them. They need, you to, test, they need to hear your prayer request. And because the Bible says... Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's some old landmarks that we better never move very quickly. If we ever move them, we better talk about it for a long time. Some of those landmarks are Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. How quickly, how quickly lukewarm religion gets rid of the prayer meeting. And then gets rid of the Sunday night service. And then all they can muster for God is just to show up Sunday morning. And there's this feeling and this attitude, well, we really did it for God today. We showed up. Now we can go to the restaurant and we can eat out. And then the rest of the day is our family day. We might go on a boat trip. We might go down to the state park and throw horseshoes The rest of the day is our day. No, it's the Lord's day. It's not your family day. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. I think that that day should be constructed so it's a special day for your family. It is for us. Man, mama makes mashed potatoes and gravy, some special meat, the big dessert. 
Coffee in the afternoon. I don't have coffee any other day of the week in the afternoon, but I do Sundays. And, and you know what? It's not uncommon for us to be still sitting around the table at 2, 3, 3 30, 4 o'clock. Do you know why? Because dad's connecting with his children. We're talking about the sermon that was preached. We're talking about what they're facing in their lives. We're talking about things that relate to our spiritual good. We're trying to keep the converse. We're trying to keep our hearts knit to our children. And so when I say it's not family day, I don't mean that, there, that family is an integral part of God's idea for the day. It's a day for you to push pause and to say, I'm going to do my very best this Lord's Day to get my soul renewed, to get my spirit refreshed, and to make my little treasures love God the way I love Him. You know what we do Sunday nights? We have family time. We get home, and the whole family is sitting in the living room. And mama's made snacks. And we're just fellowshipping. Now dad's watching the clock because once it's 10.30, i got to get upstairs. i got to get to bed. My kids hate it. And they constantly, oh, dad, it's 10.30. Dad, 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 just, just a little. I said, like I'm falling apart. I'm 44. i got to get up and get to bed. But you know, if, if the preacher has not preached too long and we, get, we start at 6 and we get out at, you know, 7.30, our people stand around and talk for an hour. I'm just about to the point where I'm ready to hire someone to lock up so I can go. But we get home and man, we, this is family time. Let's talk. Let's love on one another. We're going to, Monday morning, we're going to get up and get scattered in all kinds of directions. I'm just telling us, I have a burden about this, Brother Martin. I don't want our conference, I don't want God's missionary church to, to somehow get foggy or wish-washy or somehow, because we've not been taught. This isn't something that our forefathers who were maybe right or maybe wrong or just halfway. No, this is what the Bible teaches. A careful hermeneutical study of God's Word teaches that the fourth commandment does not have an expiration date on it. Remember the day of rest. And keep it holy. Oh, I don't know if we have any Seventh Day Adventists here or not. If we do, I'd be happy to talk to you personally. But you never convinced me in a million years that they're right about Saturday worship. I believe it dishonors our Savior when we refuse to recognize His power in the new creation. All right, I'm done. I've preached too long. You're wore out. It's time for supper. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. You know what my mama told me? She got here on Saturday. Was it Saturday you got here? She got here and the first thing she said to me was, she said, you're not going to make it. You keep preaching like you've been preaching. You're not going to make it until the finish line. I said, thanks, Mom. Appreciate that. You know what I told her, Brother Chambers? I said, that's God the Holy Ghost's problem. Amen. My voice is his. I'm going to keep preaching. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Brother Aaron Dorman, dismiss the service with prayer. Yes.